Welcome to OutDrive, folks. I'm your host, Cliff Callis, and each week I'm bringing you actionable marketing insights you can apply to reach, connect with, and convert rural American consumers. OutDrive is powered by Callis, a full-service advertising agency with a focus on marketing rural America. Callis offers a wide range of integrated marketing services, including website development, search engine marketing, social media, video, and digital. We develop strategic and creative campaigns to build your brand and your business. And you can learn more about us at ecalis.com. Now join me in the front seat as we head out on the road to success. Let's go. Hey folks, welcome to OutDrive. We've got another great story to share with you today about life and work in rural America. John Doolittle is the CEO of the Missouri Hospital Association. A graduate of Harvard University, John also earned his Master of Science degree in healthcare leadership and management from the University of Texas at Dallas. After two stints as a hospital CEO, John now leads the Missouri Hospital Association. He has been known to have said, I take care of people who take care of people. And I'm looking forward to discussing MHA and its role to support healthy communities in rural America. Welcome to OutDrive, John. Thank you, Cliff. It's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure for me as well. Been looking forward to getting to know you and hearing what the Missouri Hospital Association is up to these days. But let's start with a little background about you. Tell us about your growing up and then kind of how you ended up in this role. I'd love to. And I've realized, Cliff, I'm getting older and my bio takes a little longer to regurgitate here, but I'm going to, I'll give you the short version. Um, Born in Albany, Missouri, which is a town of about 2,000 people in the northwest corner of the state. It's the county seat. It was a great place to grow up. I was surrounded by lots of extended family, great friends, lived there throughout my schooling years. Graduated from Albany High School and went back east to Harvard University. I got to spend four years there. I have a degree in government, studied a little history, studied a little uh, even Spanish economics, had a good time back east. But one thing I learned was that from a cultural standpoint, I was much happier in the great Midwestern part of the United States. And so as soon as I graduated, I looked for work in Kansas City. And I grew up in Albany. My dad was from Kansas City, Kansas originally. So that was going to the city for the weekend. And so Kansas City was a natural place Landed at the Federal Reserve Bank and stayed there for a short time. My boss at the Fed left and went to work doing compensation and benefits work at a growing company called Cerner Corporation Mm -hmm. that obviously has had a very good last 30 years or so. So I was a Cerner associate for about 11 years, had a fantastic time learning about healthcare and learning about ways to assist with delivering high quality care at the lowest possible cost, maybe from an outsider's perspective. The great thing about being in Kansas City was that it was really close to home in Albany. And perhaps most importantly, somewhere along the way, I convinced Jenny Holtman to become Jenny Doolittle. So she grew up in Conception Junction, Missouri, just 25 miles away. So when we were in Kansas City, Jenny and I could make the triangle on a weekend. We could go to Albany and then across, or we could go to Conception and across to Albany, but always find our way back to Kansas City and started our lives together there. We're parents of six children, four of whom were born during our Kansas City years. During that time, I was working at Cerner and she was a teacher and then a family minister at our church. We were doing well and enjoying life in Kansas City. But our language never changed. Somebody would say, what are you doing this weekend? And Cliff, we would invariably say, if we were making the trip on a particular weekend, we'd say, well, we're going up home for the weekend. And all that time we were in Kansas City, Albany, Conception Junction, rural Northwest Missouri, it never stopped being home. And my predecessor, I haven't told you the part yet where I moved home and became president of my hometown hospital, but my predecessor, who was the president CEO of that hospital for 29 years, was a very good friend, someone for whom I had worked earlier in life, and he was there forever, did a wonderful job, and he was very concerned about what was going to happen after his retirement. He and I started having conversations about succession. He hoped that the board in Albany 
would be willing to select a bit of a non-traditional candidate with local ties. I hoped the same thing. And eventually they did. And I had the opportunity to move home to Albany in 2010. And so Jenny and I, the four kids who moved and the two who were born later, made a life in Albany for 11 years. And the last seven years I was in Albany, I served on the board of trustees for Missouri Hospital Association. And I guess we'll talk more about what MHA is and does. But Mm -hmm. for the last seven years, I was on the MHA board. And uh, another really great leader with long tenure was a guy named Herb Kuhn. Herb was the president and CEO here at the association, and Herb announced his retirement. I became a candidate to potentially replace her if such a thing can be done. And the board granted me that opportunity a little over a year ago. So I moved to Jeff City, lived in a rental house while my family finished things up in Albany. One of our kids was a senior in high school. And then this summer, just three or four months ago, the rest of the family moved to Jefferson City. And here we are. I've completed a year at the helm of MHA. And family is developing new friendships and routines. What a great story. It just seems like one piece led to another to take you where you are today. It seems like a natural progression for you. I've never been the type who sat around and strategized from a career perspective. You know, I'm doing A today and I want to get to B or C. I've always had the luxury of working for great people and in great organizations. And I tried my best to do a good job. And then people often have come to me with an opportunity. And some of those opportunities were the right ones. They fit from a life and lifestyle perspective. And so I've just really been fortunate. It has all worked out beautifully. I'm not sure I would have ever guessed that I'd be sitting here living and working in Jefferson City, Missouri. But looking back, it all seems very fortuitous. And I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah, it makes sense. So what attracted you to healthcare or healthcare administration? What was it about it that it's like, I, I think I like this. Yeah, I have always wanted to, you know, sort of save the world. I enjoy volunteer activities. I've been involved in scouts and coaching and church and a number of other things. And from a career standpoint, going all the way back to when I started at Cerner, you know, is a bit of a, a celebrity in our region, right? Neil Patterson was the founder and chairman and longtime CEO at Cerner. And I'll never forget, I I went to orientation and Neil spoke and he talked about healthcare quality and the opportunity to improve healthcare quality and lives that we could save by helping to improve the practice of healthcare. And he said, you know, you all are very lucky. You could be going to work today for some company that is trying to grow market share by increasing sales in China And instead, you're working for a company that's going to help save all those people. And that's just incredibly appealing. So I was at Cerner, and I enjoyed looking at the world, thinking about it from a bit of an outsider's perspective. But during my 11 years at Cerner, I kept taking assignments that moved me closer to the actual provision of care, where the rubber meets the road, hospitals and health systems, doctor's offices, all those things. And the closer I got, the more I could really connect with that sense of purpose. And so to be afforded the opportunity to move to my hometown and really be much more closely involved in the provision of care was just such an honor and such a pleasure. And it all really fit. And if anything, that's been the hardest part about making the move from Albany and from my hometown hospital to working here at the association is that I've taken maybe one step a little further away from the direct provision of care. And that's okay because I've seen the benefit and the quality of what MHA does to help its members. And I feel like this is a wonderful place for me to help make a difference, perhaps in a, on a larger scale. But I will admit, I do miss being able to walk down the hall to a patient room or check on nurses and docs and other folks who are working in the hospital and really feel closeness and that that satisfaction, that ability to really directly help a patient. I can imagine that. Well, don't you feel like that those years at the Albany Hospital uniquely prepared you for the role you're filling today? I do. I do. Missouri Hospital Association exists to serve its members, our member hospitals around the state. And experience inside a hospital or health system is not required but I think it's very helpful. There's some necessary prior knowledge about what happens 
what matters, what doesn't, who listens to whom, how do you really affect change? And I think the time I spent in Albany and then during my time in Albany, we actually became part of a larger system. So we were part of an independent rural critical access hospital when I got there. And four years in, we became part of Mosaic Life Care, a larger system that's based in St. Joseph, Missouri. And learning the differences in ways to influence and ways to be part of a larger system and how to bring ideas, but also accept and learn and be humble about things that came from outside, I think was great training for now sitting in a role where I'm working among 140 member hospitals and trying to bring the best ideas and the best practices to everybody. We'll talk a little bit about maybe some of the major initiatives going on with Missouri Hospital Association right now. Yeah, thank you for that opportunity. This is one of my favorite topics, as you can imagine. And there are a number of things that we do at MHA. And Missouri Hospital Association is one of the larger ones, and I think the more complex ones across the country. And I'm really you know, super glad to be here trying to help support the people here who are doing that work. Most people think of us as an advocacy organization, and we surely are. We do state and federal legislative advocacy. We work on regulatory issues. We try and provide an excellent conduit between our membership and government entities or other stakeholders. And so there's no question advocacy is a big part of it. We also have an entire department dedicated to quality, safety, and research. And so that's the part of MHA that really makes its way inside of our member institutions and helps them improve practices. Like I said, share best practices, provide education. That part of the organization also works under contract with larger stakeholder entities like governments or perhaps attracts and facilitates grants that are designed to improve the quality of care. So that's another sort of big picture when you think about our major initiatives, you'd have to think about that part, we provide incredible training and education to members. And so there's a communications and education shop here. We have a data business, actually about 30% of the headcount, about 115 people who work at the association work specifically in the health industry data Institute. And so we collect information in Missouri and we have state partners, I think 14 state partners around the country for whom we provide services And you kind of put all of that together, it gives us a great platform to be able to, you know, use that information, that experience, those relationships to be able to help on the advocacy side, legislators, regulators, and others understand what the actual impacts are of laws and rules and the sorts of things that that they're doing to try and help keep people safe. When you think about what our current initiatives are then, From a cultural standpoint, quality and safety standpoint, we're absolutely working on community health and health equity. Hospitals, health systems, physician offices, other settings of care, there's so much more than a break fix. You know, I'm sick, help me get better. They are that, but those organizations are thinking about quality of life. They're thinking about economic health. They're thinking about improving social determinants of health so that everybody has an opportunity to live a healthy and well, the best life they choose to live. And so our largest initiatives, setting advocacy aside for just a moment, really have to do with the promotion of health equity and education about how folks are doing and how we can help them do better. How do we help make connections from a workforce standpoint so that People who work in healthcare feel well supported, well trained, and that people who don't yet work in healthcare understand what opportunities are available, can connect to educational partners, and can find their way into a vocation of taking care of people. So, you know, those are a couple of major initiatives. Then, from an advocacy standpoint, of course, we're about to head into another legislative session in just a couple of months here in Missouri. And We're very fortunate. A number of new folks are enrolled in the state of Missouri in health coverage through MoHealthNet. And we've been working to help reform and improve the Missouri Medicaid system so that we collectively can do a great job of taking care of folks there. We're constantly thinking about new ways to innovate and bring value to all of our beneficiaries, whether they be Medicare recipients, people with private insurance, Medicaid, People with no coverage whatsoever, hospitals and health systems are that place where everybody knows they can go when they need help. 
and our major initiatives are very much around helping our members meet their current and future missions. Wow. You guys have way more going on than I would have ever expected. And it all makes sense from the CEO role. How do you spend your day? That's a great question. It sounds like a cliche. No two days have been the same here. MHA is about relationships and it's about support, which means it's about listening. And so I get lots of opportunities to visit our members and visit with our members. I get lots of opportunities within this dynamic organization to figure out how people with a variety of different areas of expertise and relationships can bring their capabilities together so that we can work on something as complex as workforce or food deserts or diversity, equity, and inclusion. These huge societal factors all impact people's health and wellness. And so it's our job to, pardon the cliche, sort of you know, think globally and act locally a little bit. We have to understand all those macro factors and then distill those things into programs and offerings and relationships and conversations where we can bring new capability to bear. So healthcare is a very challenging and complex industry, I believe. Are urban hospitals facing the same challenges as rural hospitals? Oh, what a great question. One thing that is abundantly clear, it was clear to me when I was in Albany, and now it is even so much clearer that I'm here with the association, is that we are part of one interconnected, interdependent system. Mm -hmm. And so there are different sort of applications or problems that present themselves on a daily basis, perhaps in a large academic medical center that are different from the way things might present themselves in Albany, Missouri, or Sedalia, Missouri, or anywhere in between. But the overall issues related to helping individuals manage their lives, manage their wellness, being available to them, being able to work miracles when miracles are required, but largely be a positive influence. Those are consistent. The big differences from hospital to hospital, health system to health system, urban to rural, that sort of thing are largely operational challenges. They're things that are impacted by workforce, for example, over the last couple of years, we've seen waves throughout the COVID pandemic, and we've seen times that there was overwhelming demand for services, which meant there was overwhelming demand for human resources that, that were themselves tired, sick, working through difficulties. And so when you think about who was hit the hardest over the last couple of years, in many cases, you think of larger facilities with greater technological capabilities, urban centers that attracted the sickest of the sick. Interestingly enough, though, those same patients may very well have started their care journey in Albany, Missouri. They may have started in Sedalia. They may have started it walking into a neighborhood pharmacy. Who knows? And so there are different operational challenges and realities. There are different financial conditions by group, depending on who's paying for care and what sort of care you can deliver. The healthcare system is incredibly complex in that way. But there also is a sameness. And right now, unfortunately, we're in a tough time. Hospitals and health systems are in a really difficult period, having performed heroically for a long time, but particularly for the last couple of years in, in response to the COVID pandemic. Folks are a little tired. We received a great deal of funding that was designed to sort of carry out almost a wartime effort against the pandemic. And now the money is gone. The lights are off. We're trying to get back to normal, but we're doing so with a reduced capacity and much higher expenses, wages, and particularly supplies. And so there is a sameness, urban, rural, suburban, that we're all facing, which is how are we going to keep this up and how are we going to deliver the great care that people deserve? And, you know, that's a great question in and of itself. You know, when I think about what hospitals do to take care of those who need health care, I also think about all the other intangibles that hospitals provide. Talk a little bit about that from your perspective. 
Uh, thank you for a- another great question. And this is, you know, sometimes I speak in cliches, I guess, I don't know, but the reason I'm here at the hospital association is that I really do think we're the good guys. And I, I don't mean we're the only good guys, but as I work with hospitals and health systems, the things that we consider part of our mission are very difficult to define or draw a box around. We're determined to be great employers. We're determined to work well to provide educational opportunities, beautification of parks, fresh, healthy food, better living conditions, all of these things that impact the health and wellness of the people we get to serve are kind of our business. And so when you think about what it is for a community to have access to a hospital, hospitals make their community so much richer. And for me to be in that role in Albany, in my hometown, and to have the flexibility to be a steward, it was such an honor. And I see it now across the hospitals and health systems in the state. They really do care about so much more than taking care of sick people. And they aren't always paid to do it necessarily. It isn't always super clear whose responsibility it should be, but hospitals everywhere would tell you and executives everywhere would tell you the payment system we have, the regulatory environment that's in place, a lot of other things. They're not the way we would design them if we were starting from scratch, but you figure it out and you work through it because these are mission driven folks who are determined to make their communities better. That's a whole lot more than just healthcare. Absolutely. I mean, when you think about a community that does have a healthcare system or hospital or whatever that looks like, and those who do not, it is sort of the have and the have nots. And from an economic standpoint, or in in the case of maybe business recruitment, business retention, having that healthcare organization available to employees of large organizations, well, small and large, it's just the vital piece. It's one of the key components of having the economic development picture totally in place. And I think sometimes people forget that and take for granted that, oh yeah, we've got a hospital here, but I'm going to go over here when many times they need to be supporting that local hospital as much as they possibly can. Yeah. It's interesting because you never want anyone, you never want to ask anyone to act against their own best interest, right? I I don't that anybody has a duty to use the local hospital, but oftentimes the local hospital is a whole lot better than the locals know. It's funny. Everybody looks around in a consumeristic society and says, well, this is the thing we got. How good can it be? I'm going to go chase the other shiny object. And the reality is, as I go around the state and I talk to folks, extraordinary care is delivered in our hospitals. And because of the relationships that they have, the way that specialty care is shared, the way that people think and plan regionally around the availability of care, the way technology can be used to connect to folks in distant sites, the reality is life is complex. Health is a huge part of life. It's also complex. And when people can plug in with a local presence that really has their best interest in heart, I don't think they're doing the local hospital a favor. I think they're doing what's best for them. And they're getting a trusted guide who can walk them through the complexity when they do have to go somewhere else for services. But at the end of the day, when I'm trying to put together my picture, those trusted relationships I have with people who know me and my circumstance, I think those are my best shot. I agree with that. And I think sometimes it just comes from lack of awareness. And, you know, you can do all the marketing in the world, but sometimes you just, you you only know what you know, right? So, you know, I think about one of the initiatives that we have going here, and that is to expose the community to really what the hospital is all about from an insider's point of view. Because if you think about it, most people will only go to a hospital if they need health care or to visit someone, but they don't get to see all the technology, all the passion of the employees, all the facilities that are available to treat them. And so we have this new initiative where we're doing sort of behind the scenes tours, taking people through the hospital on in small groups. Our CEO, Lori Whiteman, is many times leading that tour and they come away saying, wow, I had no idea this was happening here. It's just, it's I, I've heard amazing. that. I love it. Yeah, that's so good. 
And there's no way you can do too much of that. And, you know, when people ask about the last couple of years of COVID, Cliff, that's something that we missed. We couldn't just bring people in, show them around, have them see what was going on because of concerns about infection prevention. And as it's appropriate, as we move forward, I absolutely love what you're suggesting. We need to help folks reconnect with the capability and the compassion that's available in their hospitals. Absolutely. You know, I mentioned marketing and of course the focus of our podcast is marketing in and to rural America. What's MHA doing from a marketing standpoint to communicate with its members or prospective members? And then maybe anything creative that you're seeing that hospitals are doing to tell their story. Yeah, that's great. To the point that you just made, I think testimonials are so powerful. There are stories in every community about people who have had extraordinary outcomes that started and perhaps ended in the local community. But even if it meant they started there and they went somewhere else for a sort of coordinated care experience, I think as I was in Albany trying to tell our stories, first and foremost, you respect people's privacy. You never want to, you know, you never want to have a conversation where you're seemingly using somebody's misfortune to make a point. Right. Right. But so many people are grateful when they've received extraordinary care and they've had this experience and they really want to tell other people about what's available. And I think grateful patient programs are very common in the world of philanthropy. But I think from a marketing perspective, understanding when you've got highly motivated people that have great stories and then figuring out ways to amplify those stories, very valuable, very, very valuable. You ask about what MHA is doing. This happens to be the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Missouri Hospital Association. Congratulations. And, uh, thank you. We've had a good century and, and yeah. we're going to have another one. You know, I'm, I'm excited for what comes next. And I, I'm one of these guys that likes to appreciate the past, but then immediately look at what's coming the next hundred years. <laughs> but we're about to have our annual convention and trade show. It's our largest event of the year. And leading up to that, and then particularly at the convention, we've really been focused on storytelling and the power of stories. We've told stories. We've collected stories from our members around the state. We've asked them to brag on each other, right? So we've done profiles of people who are care providers in all of the hospitals, all the areas around the state. We've asked them to send us information and we've highlighted them. We've done the same thing with our staff. We've tried to make sure that people know us, know how accessible we are, know how much we like to help them by doing similar profiles. So we've tried to put human faces on these concepts. And then as we head into our convention, storytelling is a huge focus. And we want to help people understand that it is honorable to sort of quietly do their jobs and serve their communities. And that's easy for particularly rural folks, right? Rural folks love to just put their heads down and do their jobs. Right. And it's one of the things I love about them, but there is an opportunity to tell those remarkable stories and have great impact. And so we're trying to amplify that as an association. And we try to help our members think about how they're sharing their stories and not only for their own good individually, but one of our key elements as an association is to impact the way not just legislators, not just regulators, but the general public feels about hospitals and health systems. How do we shape the, this view? How do we help determine what becomes viral, what people are talking about, what their knee-jerk reaction is when they think about hospitals and health systems? Because we swim in upstream on that. Healthcare is expensive. It's complex. People have had bad experiences because we're all mortal. We all break. And so there are always bad stories about things that happen to folks. And there were things that hospitals and health systems couldn't fix. We own that. We talk about it. And then we also really try to think about how to tell stories in a fair and reasonable way, not sugarcoated, so that people understand the limitations of what we can do, but the incredible value of what we provide. Well, I think you're right on target. And that's very timely. There are so many powerful stories out there. People like hearing these stories and when hospitals tell them, I think it builds trust that this is a good place that will take care of you. And I think, you know, ultimately that's really what they've got to hang their hat on. 
as I think about storytelling, I think about social media and in the healthcare arena, there's lots of perspectives about how to use social in a, as part of a communications program. And with privacy laws, HIPAA laws, some people, they use it broadly and comprehensively, and others are scared to death by it. What's your perspective on the use of social media for healthcare organizations? I think they have to be in the mix. You have to have a voice and you have to be putting information out. I often, when I was a hospital president, was frustrated by my inability to tell the truth about a story that went viral, a complaint that went viral, an opinion that was shared. I often had a whole lot more of the story than what was available in the world of social media. And I simply couldn't tell it for all the reasons you say, just human decency, privacy laws, all the rest. And so you you try to stay above the fray and you should. But I think you do have to be out there with a presence. I do think you have to tell your story and you have to hope that reasonable people at some point, no matter how sensational the thing is that they read, will ask themselves the question, which of these things do I think is more likely to be true? (laughs) You can't be sure what they're going to choose, but I think you have to, like I said, you have to tell a story. People are constantly looking for a hero. They're constantly looking for a villain. They're constantly looking for a scandal. They're constantly looking for an explanation. And you can't play in some of those spaces, but you need to play and you need to have a presence and an identity that people can refer to as they're trying to figure out whether or not to give you the benefit of the doubt, I think. Well, I like the way that you express that. You do have to have the voice because if you don't have a voice, they're going to give you a voice and it may not be what you want it to be. So you have to be out there telling your story. I I concur. So earlier you mentioned the challenges of workforce. Certainly there's a labor shortage that's hitting everybody. I don't know anybody that's not looking to hire right now. Mm -hmm. A great time to be an employee, I suppose. But also in the healthcare arena, it has been a hard couple of years on folks. And, you know, we certainly appreciate everything that healthcare workers have done to take care of our country. Thank you. Are you seeing any creative or out of the box strategies that people are using to attract healthcare workers back or into the industry? Yeah, there are some interesting strategies that people are using. The American Hospital Association works on this a fair bit and works with us a fair bit. And they have an interesting framework, I think. They are, no matter what the intervention, it needs to start as soon as possible. And there are things that will have a now impact, a near impact, and a far impact. So helping second and third graders take tours and fall in love with the idea of being a healthcare professional someday is something we have to do today and tomorrow. Mm -hmm. but that's not likely to really have demonstrable benefit for a little bit, right? We're still going to do it from a near term standpoint. How can we aid educational institutions in finding and paying faculty? How can we use folks as adjunct faculty for training that may not have been available in the past? How do we get the machine tuned up the best we can right now to help us provide more folks in the next couple of years? And then the now stuff is really about, work design and resilience and taking care of people who take care of people, right? It's about innovative strategies to help support people who have made this their life's calling. And what can we do to recruit them, to re-recruit them, to support them? If there are folks who are just done working in a certain care setting or on a certain schedule, how can we be creative about letting them bring their expertise to bear to help people? I can use technology, different design. So we do see good examples of organizations that are looking for ways to help mission-driven people continue to apply their skills and talents. And we do our best to help with that. These are the sorts of things we, we convene. We roll out new programs to help people talk about how they're doing in confidential ways use technology to check in with them occasionally, make sure that folks who need help dealing with stress and difficulty are getting it in a way that's acceptable to them because there, there surely is, can, you know, there are a lot of folks who probably could use some help and don't want to ask for it. Maybe don't want their employer to know it. How can we help with programs 
that use evidence-based resiliency tools and approaches to help support the workforce today? And then how do we make sure that our members know about those and are deploying them? Those are the sorts of things that associations can do to help out right now. And then, of course, as I said, we're also working on things that have a more near-term and a longer-term potential impact. Good, good. We've got to attract them. We need them. Desperately need yeah. them. Helping people find this vocation, understand what's available to them economically. Healthcare's great, right? Healthcare is going to be everywhere. There's tremendous demand. You do get to feel like you're saving the world. Telling that story and helping people understand the diversity of careers that are available in, in, in healthcare, direct care, you know, mechanics, IT, all the rest. Hospitals and health systems are microcosms of the broader community. And so finding mission-driven folks who want to be part of a health system, whether in direct care or otherwise, and, and then helping them fall in love with that as part of their identity is another thing that's very important to us and our members. You made the move to Jeff City from Albany. When I think about Jeff City, it's a nice, small city in the middle of Missouri, but it's still part of what I characterize as rural Missouri, uh, mm-hmm. or you know, broader yet, rural America. Tell us what you like about rural America. Oh, boy. I have an Uncle Bill, and Bill grew up in Kansas City, Kansas. He took over from my grandpa as the owner of a service station at 29th and State, Kansas City, Kansas. And about halfway through his career, sort of wage earning years, he moved to Albany and he bought a convenience store, set up a business there. And eventually married a woman from a different part of the country and he moved. And every once in a while, I'd get my Uncle Bill wisdom moments, you know, and he'd say, John, I just don't think most people understand what a luxury it is to live in Albany, Missouri. And this conversation, Cliff, is so often about not being able to go to Target or where's the closest movie theater or how long it takes to get to a Royals game or whatever else it is. And those things are true, but it is a luxury to live in a community where people know and care about each other. They sacrifice a little bit of anonymity and consumerism and in exchange, they get these wonderfully deep relationships. You get to see the impact of what you're doing. Right. There's not an actual scoreboard on every corner, but it's so easy to connect with purpose. It's so easy to participate in institutions and small towns and to be part of a collective in a way that you can understand. And I think most rural folks appreciate that. They want to live out loud. They want to be accountable for what they're doing. Like I said before, they don't necessarily want a bunch of credit for it. Most people want to kind of put their head down, work hard, get their job done, and then relax with their friends. And I loved my 11 years back in Albany. I have tremendous respect for people in rural areas. I've also lived in London, England, Boston, Kansas City, and I've found wonderful communities in all those places. So this isn't a rural versus urban thing. But some folks try to make the conversation sort of rural versus urban, and it's as though rural is, you know, Thank goodness for those nice people that are out there growing our food. But if they could see the lights of the big city, would they leave and never come back? Cliff, I saw the lights of a lot of big cities and I moved home. And I am a believer in rural life who also has a tremendous appreciation for what happens in cities and suburbs. Absolutely. We have it good. They do as well. They do as well. John, I've really enjoyed visiting with you today. It's been very interesting. What else would you like to share with our OutDrive audience today that you think they might find interesting or maybe inspirational? Well, I'll do two things, and these are a little bit self-serving, but thanks for the opportunity. Number one, it's been a tough couple of years, not just for healthcare workers, but for everybody. One of my professors at Harvard was a pediatrician named Robert Coles, and we went this whole semester And he told all these amazing stories. The literature of social reflection was the name of the class. And we got there for the final, the big last lecture with Dr. Coles. And he says, have you figured out yet what the point of this class is? And he went, well, kind of sat there like, "Uh, no. He said, be kind, be kind, be kind. Wow, that's powerful. It was pretty good. It was pretty good. And so the one thing I'd want to tell your listeners is, and it's tough out there, be kind. Be kind to healthcare workers. They've had a rough couple of years, but teachers, clergy, neighbors on the street, whatever it is, man, just be kind. 
The second thing, particular to hospitals and healthcare systems, they do important work. It's not easy. There is a spot on the team for every single person. We, we talked about workforce and careers and things like that. We are back now to where hospitals are able to welcome volunteers in a responsible way. We have hospitals and health systems that carry out all sorts of community betterment activities, community gardens, housing projects, working with local schools, whatever else it is. Anybody who's listening to this can join the team. Please, please, please work with your local hospital, your local health system, and do what you can to make your community better. Thanks for a great pitch for local health care. Yeah, thank you. John, thanks for being with us today. It's been a delight. Thank you, Cliff. You're welcome, folks. Thanks for listening to OutDrive. I hope you've enjoyed our visit today with John Doolittle, President and CEO of the Missouri Hospital Association. Come back again next week, and I'll take you down the roads of rural America, where it's heaven on earth. Thanks for taking a ride with us on OutDrive. This episode is complete, so head on over to eCalis.com for show notes and more insight you can apply to help drive your business growth. And be sure to sign up for our free monthly e-letter, OutThink, for even more helpful content about marketing to rural America. Have a great day and keep on driving.